Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the last lecture of uh, week three of Adam's Two Materials. Today, we're going to do a little bit of a review of what we learned over the week. And also, uh, we're going to do an example of a phonon calculation and discuss how I can use the information that I get uh, that we learned about normal modes uh, to make predictions of optical properties. Um, so we learn is that if I have a molecule or a crystal at low temperatures, I have a collection of atoms at low temperatures, then uh, their dynamics can be described as a set of uh, uncoupled harmonic oscillators. Okay, uh, To obtain this set of uh, normal modes, uh, in, in the case of molecules, non-periodic systems, we have to build the Hessian matrix that you see right here. Uh, Kij is the second derivative of the potential energy with respect to coordinates i and j. And then by when I diagonalize this matrix, the eigenvalues represent uh, the square of the vibrational frequencies, and the eigenvectors represent the normal modes. Okay, and remember uh, the dynamics of the system can then be decomposed in these independent oscillators that behave as harmonic oscillators. In the case of crystals, uh, the things are a little bit more complicated because I have a very large number of unit cells. Okay, So each unit cell essentially behaves like a molecule, uh, but in order to describe how one unit cell uh, compares to the next and to the next, um, we have to invoke reciprocal space K. So essentially, we end up with something very similar to the Hessian matrix. It's called the dynamical matrix, and the dynamical matrix depends on K. So I need to solve, I need to diagonalize the dynamical matrix for various uh, values of K. This is all good and uh, very nice at low temperatures, okay? Uh, when in general, if I'm interested in dynamics, um, I really need to solve the many-body problem computationally. Um, and in that case, then I don't approximate that the interactions are quadratic, like we do at low temperatures, and the unharmonicities in the potentials uh, can, be, can be captured. Remember, the binding curve for two atoms looks like that. It's really only harmonic at the bottom. So I move away, there's unharmonicities that only when I do a simulation like what you see here, um, I'm really beginning, you know, I'm able to capture uh, these unharmonic effects that occur uh, for large uh, deviations from um, the equilibrium position. And you know, I can take this all the way to, like you see here in the example, to look at uh, melting. Uh, and of course, uh, at do uh, under those, uh, at those temperatures, the harmonic approximation and normal modes uh, break down. Um, so uh, let's uh, do uh, an example of a normal mode calculation. Uh, in particular, we're going to discuss a, an infinite system, a one-dimensional, very simple uh, crystal. And, um, and we're doing this because in the homework assignment, you're going to solve a di the dynamics of a diatomic system. You're going to find the normal modes there. So in the lecture, I'm going to do this as an example of the calculation of a dynamical matrix and, and its solution. So I have a, a 1D chain of atoms. They all have mass m, okay, and they interact with springs. And these springs only apply to first nearest neighbors. Okay, so an atom interacts only uh, with the next, uh, the 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 atom right be before and right after, with a spring of spring constant k. So what you see there is an expression for the potential energy. Okay, In this system, I have a single particle per unit cell. So n is only 1. 
And if you remember our nomenclature with, with lowercase meaning the atom in the unit cell and capital letters indicating the uh, unit cell at which you are, uh, delta R, it's only atom one, okay, that I care about, and capital I tells me which uh, unit cell I'm in, and of course the interaction is between I and I plus one. If I sum over all of possible capital I's, uh, I added all the all the potential energy terms of my little uh, springs. All right. So if you remember from last lecture, the equation of motion for this system uh, can be written in this way, uh, where H I J is the dynamical matrix, and U are the is the eigenvector. Okay, the solution. Of course, remember in this system. Uh, 3n is really 1, okay? I don't live in three dimensions. So this sum is really, there's only one uh, one variable to go over, okay? All right, I can solve this very easily now for my system. I can calculate the k values that go into the dynamical matrix. These are just simple derivatives of uh, the potential energy expression. I get 2k. Uh, when it's the second derivative with the same variable two times, and negative k when it's the derivative of uh, i and i plus one, or i and i minus one, when I'm uh, when the two variables i and j are separated by a single unit cell. So I can plug that into my dynamical matrix H i j. Of course, the dynamical matrix. Uh, since it's a 1D system with a single atom per unit cell, has dimension, it's a one by one matrix. And the expression, you can see here, there's three uh, non-zero terms. Uh, the one in the middle is the self-interaction, the one side with itself. Uh, the one on the right is the interaction of one atom with the one that's at negative A, okay? You can see here. And uh, the first term is the interaction of the atom with the with the one right next to it. Okay. Um, after a little bit of uh, algebra, I come to this expression uh, for the for the dynamical matrix, uh, which then I plug into my equation of motion, and I can get an expression for the frequency, the eigenvalue. Uh, as a function of k, okay? You can see here it's uh, proportional to the absolute value of uh, sine, okay? So this relationship is called uh, the dispersion relationship. Uh, it's frequency as a function of k. And remember k, uh, the, the, the k is limited to the first brilliant zone which in 1D goes from negative pi over A to a positive pi over A. And if I plot this curve, I'm going to get a dispersion curve that looks like that. Okay, it's symmetric around the um, gamma point, and it goes to a value of 2 square root of K over M. Uh, for vibrations that have a wave vector of pi over a, okay? Uh, you can read more about uh, phonons in any solid uh, state physics book. Um, I, if you've done the uh, course on nanoscale thermal transport by uh, Professor Tim Fisher, you'd have learned quite a bit about dispersion curves, so I'd recommend uh, that if, if you're interested in, uh, check out his lectures and um, and uh, read uh, solid state uh, physics books. But uh, in atoms to materials, we're going to move on and, and tackle other topics. Before doing that, this is an example of the dispersion curve for aluminum. Okay, uh, aluminum has a single atom in the unit cell, but it doesn't live in one D. Of course, it lives in three D. So you can see that. 
the, there's multiple branches of the dispersion curve uh, as you have uh, longitudinal and transverse uh, vibrations. And these longitudinal and transverse vibrations have different sounds of speed, okay, which are the initial slope of this dispersion curve that relates the frequency uh, with the wave vector. Okay, so uh, as you all know, that uh, initial slope uh, will be the velocity of the waves uh, traveling through the system. Okay, so e enough about uh, phonons and dispersions. Uh, this information that we've collected, the, this description of the dynamics of a material in terms of vibrational modes, in terms of normal modes, um, is uh, very useful for many things. As we said earlier, we're going to use this next week to compute thermal properties of materials. Uh, but now we're going to discuss how I can use that, uh, make use of that information to compute optical properties. Okay. So if I have a dipole moment oscillated, oscillating in time, okay, a vibrating dipole, uh, let's say an OH atom that's vibrating, uh, because the dipole moment is changing with time, then a, an accelerated charge emits electromagnetic radiation and can absorb electromagnetic radiation. So uh, an oscillating uh, dipole with a given frequency can emit or absorb uh, uh, light at that uh, at the frequency that it absorbs uh, these the, the uh, most of the vibrational frequencies that uh, we've been talking about are in the infrared and so understanding of the vibrational uh, frequencies of a molecule or a solid allows us to understand their optical properties at, at uh, approximately infrared um, region of the spectrum uh, to do that, the first thing I need to do, I have these normal modes. I need to understand whether these normal modes, as the molecule moves, uh, does the, the um, dipole moment change. So I need to compute first a dipole moment strength, uh, also called the charge vector for each of my normal modes. Okay, And uh, this equation at the top shows how to do that. It's essentially projecting uh, the local charge on the atom. It's actually a, a charge tensor called the Born Effective Charge. Uh, projecting that over the uh, normal modes. So row here are the displacements of the normal mode. And this will give me an overall, uh, the, the dipole moment associated with the mode. Uh, once I have that, uh, Z, which is the dipole moment associated with that mode, then uh, I know, then I can compute the real and the imaginary part of the dielectric constants uh, with the knowledge of this dipole moment and the vibrational frequencies of that specific mode. Okay, so the, uh, elect the real and imaginary parts of the dielectric constant can be, can be calculated as a sum over all my normal modes of uh, the uh, strength of the dipole moment and with information also of their frequency. Okay, so in uh, week set five, you're going to use ab initio calculations with these techniques to predict the dielectric properties uh, of uh, materials. So uh, let me finish uh, summing up what we've been doing uh, this week. Um, after the first two weeks where we looked at the electronic structure of materials, uh, where we made the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which was uh, essentially that we were going to keep the atoms fixed well, we'll solve for the electrons. Now, this week, we worried about what, how the atoms move and what, what they do. And we discussed molecular dynamics, which essentially is solving classical equations of motion, uh, F equals ma, or equations written in Hamilton's way, uh, solving those for, for uh, the material of interest. We either solve it in a computer, or under uh, uh, some special conditions, like low temperature, we can actually 
solve analytically uh, these oscillations because we can make a harmonic approximation. At the heart of this is the calculation of the force uh, that comes that, that is computed as a negative gradient of a potential energy function. We spend quite a bit of time talking about uh, how one can describe this potential energy function for a, a, a variety of different materials using interatomic potentials. Of course, I can do an ab initio calculation to obtain this uh, potential energy function. Um, uh, however, those are more expensive computationally, okay? But uh, this parameter v that we have here, uh, this function v, is uh, would be the eigenvalue of the Schrodinger equation uh, within the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Okay, so the main things, uh, the the main uh, two approximations that we're doing when we do molecular dynamics simulations are the interatomic potential. Okay, that we almost never know exactly, so we approximate them, and also the fact that it's classical. Uh, we're using classical mechanics which works uh, reasonably well except at very low temperatures. We're going to see next week why that is and also for very light atoms. Okay, And, and again next week we're going to discuss what happens. You can kind of guess why this breaks down at very low temperatures. If I bring the temperature down in classical mechanics things would tend to slow down at uh, temperature equals to zero, classical mechanics would say that all the atoms stop vibrating, they go to their equilibrium ground state position, and of course the uh, uncertainty principle and Heisenberg uh, don't let us do that, right? So we I cannot know the position and the velocity of the particles with infinite accuracy. So something will break down if I go to very, very low temperatures. Um, other than that, under those conditions, uh, so those are the two main approximations, okay, classical mechanics and the interatomic potential. Uh, however, if I'm, uh, if I restrict myself to relatively low temperatures where the, the potentials beha behave more or less harmonically, I can approximate, I, I can uh, make a Taylor expansion of the potential energy and stop at the quadratic term, and then I can solve for normal modes or phonons if I'm in uh, thinking of crystals. And uh, those descriptions are actually very uh, interesting and, and uh, very powerful uh, to understand uh, materials phenomena. Okay? All right, so uh, th that's the uh, end of uh, week three. In week four, we're going to spend time learning about statistical mechanics and how to relate these atomic level phenomena and electronic level phenomena to thermodynamics and the macroscopic world. Thank you very much.